Hello, my name is Grace Hancock, and today I will be presenting on this week's module topic, bookbinding. Specifically, I will be making an argument as to why the history of bookbinding practices deserves to be studied academically. All things considered, the study of the history of bookbinding practices is a relatively new academic field. Serious research into bookbinding practices did not begin until the late 19th century. Because of this, bookbinding practices that predate the 19th century are not well documented. The study of the history of bookbinding practices is further complicated by the fact that not all methods of bookbinding were made to last. Therefore, books bound with less sturdy materials for the most part, no longer exists today for the use of academic study. That being said, how well bookbinding practices have been documented and when they started to be documented is not the focus of my argument. I am more interested in analyzing what can be learned from the academic study of the history of bookbinding practices and why it is relevant. It is important to keep in mind that it did not become common practice for books to be sold already bound until the mid-19th century. Before then, books were sold in sheets, and it was the responsibility of the buyer to have their purchase bound. During the hand-press printing period, which, which spans from roughly the mid-15th century up to the 19th century, it was common practice for sheets of text to be bound or half-bound for the purposes of protecting the sheets between the period of which they left the print shop, were procured by a bookseller, and up to when they were purchased. This means that the binding in which a book first appeared was often just a first in a series of transitions from unbound to bound to rebound, and so on. This tells us that both the quality of the binding of an individual book and the processes of binding and rebinding that an individual book has gone through are evident of how that individual book was valued by either its printer, bookseller, publisher, or buyer. The same concept can be applied to the modern bookbinding practices of paperbacks and hardbacks. In this sense, bookbinding can serve as a mirror of society. In addition to bookbinding practices being reflective of an individual book's reception, styles of bookbinding can also be reflective of outside cultural influences. For example, Islamic and Turkish bookbinding styles have served as a strong primary source for European bookbinding design for the past 500 years. Figure 3 serves as a visual example as to what was considered an unbound or half-bound book pre-19th century. The book picture was part of an order from London by the Library Company in 1732. The copies of the work were requested to be sent unbound. The book is photographed in its original quarter leather binding and uncut edges, repaired in 1734 by the bookbinder Stephen Potts. Potts pasted a piece of stout vellum over the leather spine and added vellum quarter. quarters. To continue, I encountered difficulty in my research in finding ways in which bookbinding mirrored society post hand press printing period. I explain what I did find in the following slide. It had not dawned on me before I had done my research for this presentation that bookbinding is considered a field within the whole of the decorative arts. However, that being said, a number of experts in the history of bookbinding name the Art Deco period 
of the early 20th century as being the last period in which bookbinding had a clearly defined position within the whole of the decorative arts. This can be contributed to, to both the growing practices of, math, of mass book production from the 19th century onward and to societal changes in the early 20th century to an individual's relationship with books. To put this into context, a beautifully bound book was not the priority of the post-First World War wealthy, or for any wealthy section of a society post any of the numerous wars of the 20th century. Figure 4 is a photographical example of a book binding made in the Art Deco style. At this point, I have thrown a lot of information your way, and you are probably now wondering what it all has to do with my main argument. To summarize, the history of bookbinding practices warrants academic study because both the state and quality of an individual book's binding, including the book's own history of being bound, unbound, or rebound, can be reflective of how the book was distributed <coughs> excuse me, distributed and received by audiences. Additionally, styles of bookbinding reflect societal influences, such as outside cultural influences. The evidence I have presented demonstrates that the history of the... The evidence I have presented demonstrates that the study of the history of bookbinding practices intersects with the studies of sociology, art history, and multiple other fields. I would like to end my presentation with a few questions. Firstly, what else can be revealed through the study of the history of bookbinding practices? How would you define a bound book versus an unbound book? Is there any part in the required readings or in my presentation that you would like clarification of. Finally, I will end with some fun questions. What did you encounter when doing the required readings that surprised you the most? What was the most interesting style of bookbinding that you read about when completing the required readings? Thank you for listening to my presentation.